Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another lesson from God's Word. We're in Luke's life of Christ, Luke chapter 8 and verse 40. Luke 8 and verse 40. And like the parallel section in Mark, there are various stories here linked, really four different episodes, and they follow the same order in Mark and in Luke. We have the story of the Lord calming the wind and the waves, which we thought about a few days ago. And then we have the story of the healing of the Gadarene demoniac. And now we come to verse 40 to learn about Jairus and his daughter. And we're going to read along the way about a woman with an issue of blood as well. Verse 40, so it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him for they were all waiting for him. So one community wanted the Lord Jesus to leave and the Lord Jesus did. The Lord is a perfect gentleman. He won't force himself. If you push him out, he'll leave. Although he didn't leave the area completely without light, without a witness. He left behind the formerly demon-possessed man who could now go forth and proclaim what great things the Lord had done for him. And now he comes back to the other side of the sea and he's received. The multitude welcomed him. They were waiting for him. Now, as you read the Gospels carefully, you find out a lot of this interest was mere curiosity, that people wanted to see the Lord Jesus do miracles, the same way we enjoy watching David Copperfield or Lance Burton or old footage of Houdini or somebody like that, you know, an illusionist or a, a magic, uh, a magician, somebody like that. But the Lord Jesus wasn't doing magic, and there was no trick to this. It wasn't an illusion. It was really the power of God. And, and yet, you can imagine the interest that generated, because people are always fascinated by anything that smacks of the supernatural or the metaphysical. And so, verse 41, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. Now, that was a position that carried some esteem in the Jewish community. This was a man who was well-to-do, no doubt, a man who had authority in the synagogue. He was one of those responsible for making sure that the place where the synagogue was was kept in good order. And as we see in Acts 13 at the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, that the rulers of the synagogue are the ones who asked the apostles to give a word of exhortation. So there were certain aspects of the meeting in the synagogue that these rulers had. So a person with that kind of position would have great standing in the community. Uh, but we see for this man, he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. So in spite of his exalted position in the society, in spite of him being from the upper classes and being an esteemed, august member of the local town, he doesn't hesitate to prostrate himself before the Lord, to put himself right down and beg the Lord to come to his house. Now, when you're desperate, you know, you don't come to the Lord and say, now, Lord, you know what a good person I am and you know how important I am and what others think of me and go over all your great virtues and then ask the Lord for something. No, if you really understand your deep need and that only the Lord Jesus can help you, you come as a sinner and you prostrate yourself and you say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, as an old hymn said. You come and you say, it's not about me, not I, but Christ. I need the Lord. And we see why he was so desperate. Verse 42, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. So this was a grave situation, a man's only child, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. So you can imagine the desperation of this man, him wanting the Lord Jesus to come right now, so to speak, to immediately depart for this house. And yet here's this crowd, these curious multitudes thronging him. They're jostling. They're all around the Lord Jesus. Verse 43, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. Now the man, Jairus' daughter, was 12 years old, and he had 12 years of no doubt great pleasure in his daughter, of rejoicing in her and being able to uh, thank God for the daughter that he had and to enjoy this girl for those 12 years. And now, suddenly, that was in jeopardy of being taken away from him, to, to absolutely lose her. 
Also, for those same 12 years, there was this woman who was suffering from a hemorrhage of some sort, an issue of blood, which Leviticus makes it plain that any woman in a condition like this, anything she sat on was considered ceremonially unclean. Any garment she wore was considered unclean. Anyone she touched was considered unclean. So you can imagine this condition was not only painful and uncomfortable, but it was embarrassing and it was ultimately something that made her a pariah in her community that others did not want her around in case she defiled them or their stuff. And she was so desperate to be cured. Luke says here she had spent all her livelihood. There goes the life savings. There goes all her her substance on physicians, but she could not be healed by any. So in our day, she would head to the Mayo Clinic, she'd head to the Cleveland Clinic, she'd head to Massachusetts General and Harvard Medical School or Johns Hopkins or, uh, you know, some of the other great hospitals that are around the world. She would go to find the top specialists, and yet nobody could help her. She could not be healed by any. But verse 44 says, she came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. Now, Mark tells us in Mark chapter 5 that she had this in her mind. If I can but touch the fringe of his garment, if I can just touch the edge of that, I'll be healed. And indeed, that faith was not misplaced. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped. Imagine, this is an ongoing problem that has assailed her for 12 years, more than a decade. And suddenly, in a moment like that, the Lord has stopped the problem. Verse 45 And Jesus said, who touched me? Now, this is one of those comical little episodes in the Gospels, because when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? (coughs) Pardon me. They're astonished. I mean, who didn't touch you, Lord? You're in this great big crowd. We can imagine, you know, seeing footage of people on the campaign trail at election time and all the people around them trying to reach out and touch them. Or you think about footage of the Beatles when they came to America and all the throngs of people that wanted to touch these pop singers. And and it was some kind of scene like that. And, And yet the Lord's asking, who touched me? And the disciples are incredulous. What do you mean? Who touched you? Everybody touched you. Who didn't touch you? And yet the Lord never heals, never saves without knowing the person intimately. People aren't just a number to the Lord. They weren't statistics. The Lord knows the individual. He knows the desperate heart. He knows the heart's need. In verse 46, he explains, but Jesus said, somebody touched me for I perceive power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. I'm sure that given the nature of her condition, she got used to ducking and hiding. She got used to steering clear of people. If anyone was touched by her and they realized oh, I'm now unclean, at least for this day, and I've got to go through the process of being cleansed before I can go up and worship the Lord. They would be most irate and upset with her. But at the Lord's behest, she comes and confesses everything that the Lord did for her. She declares in the presence of all the people. She tells them her need. What a great picture of a testimony. Here I was desperate. I couldn't get help from anyone else. No one could heal me of my problem. And yet I reached out the hand of faith to the Lord Jesus and virtue came out of him. The power to heal came out and healed me. It was physical in her case, but how much we need to reach out and touch the Lord by faith. Because for a long time, we've been afflicted by a condition as well. It's the condition of sin. And we can go to all the doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists and philosophers and teachers and people we want to go to, but nobody can heal us. No one can save us from sin except the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can do the sinner good, as an old hymn says. And he responds, verse 48. Now imagine, before if someone was touched by her, they might get indignant. They might become irate. They might berate her and accuse her. How dare you touch me? They might yell at her and curse her even. 
But look at the Lord. He says in verse 48, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Faith in the Lord is never misplaced. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ saves. We are justified by faith alone. We believe on the Lord Jesus. In other words, we put our faith in him. And uh, we, she could have sat around and said hypothetically, I know if I would go to Jesus and if I would touch him, he would heal me. And she could have sat at home and say, well, I know I could do that, but I'm not going to do it. And she never went. No, she had faith and that faith caused her to go to the Lord. That faith caused her to stretch out and lay her hand on the Lord. I want to tell you, Acts 17 says he's not far from every one of us. And if you cry out to the Lord, he will save you. Wherever you are, whatever you're into, you can say, Lord, save me a sinner. And he will extricate you from the guilt of your sin, the judgment that it deserves. He will move you from being one who's condemned to one, who's being just, to one who is justified, one who's declared righteous in his sight. He'll move you from being a slave of sin to now being addicted to righteousness, wanting to live for the Lord, a slave of righteousness, the book of Romans 6 would say. And one who's now awaiting the Lord to come to deliver us from this very scene of sin and transform our mortal bodies, these bodies of humiliation, into immortal bodies, incorruptible bodies, bodies of glory, like unto his body, bodies fit, in other words, to be in the Father's house in heaven with him for all time. Well, anyone that's come to the Lord Jesus by faith, they depart with cheer because the Lord loves us with that familial love. He calls her daughter and he treats us like family to as many as received him to them, gave he the right to become the children of God. And we leave him in peace. He says, go in peace. We remember Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's objective peace with God, that God has put away our sin and God has conversely given us a positive standing in his sight of righteousness. When he looks at us, he sees us in Christ, clothed in the righteousness of God, and he receives us on that basis. We are accepted in the beloved one, Ephesians 1 says. And he also gives us the subjective peace that Philippians 4 speaks about, the peace that passes understanding. Now, remember Jairus? He was the man with the 12-year-old daughter who was dying. Well, he's still there. Verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. I can imagine that at this point, the bottom fell out for Jairus. The ruler thought, this is precisely what I feared. That's why I came so quickly to Jesus. I didn't beat around the bush. I threw myself at his feet and begged him to come and come right away. But these crowds impeded our progress and this woman slowed us down even further. I, I knew this would happen. If we didn't get there on time, it would be too late. But I like verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. Now, do you see that? The contrast again between fear and faith. Now, unbelief is that which leads us into fear. Faith is what gives us security, what gives us confidence, because we know God has it covered. He's in control. The Lord Jesus has us in his hands, and he's not going to be defeated. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We read about the disciples being afraid in the boat when they didn't have faith in the Lord. We read about the demons fearing the Lord that he would torment them because they misjudge the Lord. They have no love for the Lord, no willingness to submit to the Lord. And we find also the people of the town there in Gadara where the demoniac lived, that they were fearful of Christ and asked him to leave them. But here he tells Jairus, don't be afraid, only believe. And the way it's worded in the original language has the sense that he had already been believing. He just needed to continue to believe. And biblical saving faith has continuance to it. It is faith that goes on. It's not faith that says, well, I kind of intellectually assented to certain propositions at a certain time in my life. I, I went to camp and I prayed a prayer or I went forward at a meeting or I put up my hand and it seemed like a good thing to do at the time. But now I really don't believe in God. I really don't believe in Christ. That's not saving faith. 
that's the ephemeral passing emotional reaction that can happen. And in our Lord's parable of the sower, he talked about those who had no root in themselves, those who had no depth of earth. So when the sun came, it was desiccated, dried up and destroyed. When persecution for the word's sake comes or the love of riches, the thorns come in and choke out, the riches and the cares of this world choke it out. No, we need to go to the Lord. We need to believe and keep on believing. That's what real faith is. And he says, only believe and she will be made well. Verse 51 when no one, uh, sorry, when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, these intimate disciples, these close ones, his inner circle, we might say, who observed him on the Mount of Transfiguration and who were in Gethsemane with him and so often saw the Lord doing things and heard the Lord doing things that others didn't hear. And the father and mother of the girl, now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She's not dead, but sleeping. Now that's the great way the New Testament loves to talk about the death of a believer. A believer is just sleeping. In other words, that it's an impermanent state. It is not what's going to be so for them. They're not dead forever. They're only sleeping. And we can think about a dead body. It looks like they're sleeping. People go to funerals. They say, oh, look, he looks so natural. He looks like he's sleeping. Well, I hope I don't look like that when I sleep, but you know what I mean. And the New Testament talks about that. The Lord said about his friend Lazarus in John 11, he is sleeping. And he says this about this girl here, but he's going to awaken her from sleep. Now notice the reaction of the people. They ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. And of course, in their minds, there's no power that can overcome death, but they don't know they're dealing with the Lord Jesus. They're dealing with the one who proclaimed himself in John 11, the resurrection and the life. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand and called saying, little girl arise. Now they didn't have the right to observe what he was going to do. They wouldn't understand the salvation of the Lord. I think about Cooper's lines in his hymn when he says, Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he shall make it plain. And so he puts out the skeptics and goes in and with very little to do, no fanfare whatsoever, he addresses her, little girl arise, just a simple command. And then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. Now, Peter, James and John could have stood there and said, little girl arise, little girl arise. Father and mother could have said, little girl arise. I could say it. You could say it. We don't have the power to raise anyone back to life. But the Lord Jesus, who is the giver of life, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The upholder of life. He upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1 says. He could command and her spirit would return to her and he could raise her. And this is just a little picture of what he's going to one day do when he comes and raises the dead in Christ. And when we who are alive and remain are called up to meet him in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians 4. Then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. So even that little detail, caring for her physical need and knowing she'd be hungry. The Lord knows all about us, knows what we need. He's able to save our soul and he's able to take care of our temporal and physical needs as well. And verse 56 says, And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what would happen. He wasn't interested in fanfare and idle curiosity and just generating publicity. That wasn't what the Lord was about. He was going about doing the will of his father and laying down this regular work of signs and wonders and miracles that would authenticate his messiahship, that would show him to be the Christ of God, the savior of sinners, the prophet, priest, and king, and God who was manifest in the flesh. What a wonderful savior. He didn't delay his coming purposefully uh, to destroy faith or to hurt Jairus and his family. And what a tremendous faith they must have had afterwards when they saw even when the worst thing we imagined happened, even when our little girl was taken away, that didn't stop the Lord from doing his work. He could come in and he could raise her in his time. And for all those who've lost a children, uh, lost children rather, uh, or lost a child, the Lord is able to raise that child one day. And none of these are going to be thrown away by the Lord. The Lord is the wonderful God of resurrection. And the Lord Jesus showed that when he was on earth. How much better though, 
the fact that he would rise again from the dead, never to die anymore. He, in that sense, is the first fruits of them that sleep. He's the beginning of a great harvest unto God that will bring many sons to glory. I hope you're among that group. I hope that if you died today, your spirit and soul would go to be with the Lord and your body would be interred awaiting that day when the Lord comes to open the tombs and raise the bodies of the saints. Uh, but if you don't know the Lord, rest assured, death won't rescue you. If you die without the Lord, you go into a lost eternity. You go to hell and you will eventually be raised as well, but not to face a glorious eternity in heaven with the Lord, but to hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you, and to be righteously judged for your rejection of the Lord and for the sin that you wouldn't let him put away by the sacrifice of his son. Instead, you cling to your sin and refuse the substitute that was offered for you, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. May you come to him today because he loves you so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for listening.